Hey folks, Lindsay Setchell here from HM and HM International School of Horse and Hoof Care and today I want to talk to you about something called osteonecrosis. Osteonecrosis is all about bone loss and it's something that us as uh, hoof care professionals actually do see quite a lot when we come to severe laminitis cases. It's something that we also see a huge amount in cadaver hooves. We've processed and gone through thousands of cadaver hooves over the years and osteonecrosis is something that we see is now on the rise. We, we, are, we seem to be seeing far more horses with this problem than ever before and this problem is something which is largely man-made. In fact I say largely man-made, let's just say man-made through misinformation and misunderstanding about laminitis itself. So without further ado, let's get into it. And we're gonna be talking about osteonecrosis in our next episode of Lindsay Setchell's It's Not Rocket Science, All About Hoof Care. All right, so here we go. That was a funny rocket, wasn't it? So osteonecrosis, and I'm, I'm gonna write it over here, osteo, necrosis so it's the necrosis part osteo here means bone so it's something to do with the bone and the necrosis means that it's dying or has died so osteonecrosis in the horse's foot that's pretty serious and in fact by the time we get to that stage we we have a situation where we're not going back. We're not going to be able to save that animal. It's never going to be able to regrow P3. So let's let's have a look at what I mean. So here we have the foot. Here we go. In fact, I'm just going to do that because that's generally what they tend to look like, almost like a, a bunched up fist in a way. And then, and then here would be P3, and it would have been pointing down, there would have been P3, but in actual fact what happened is that P3 no longer exists, the tip of P3, and it tends to start to look like this, and oftentimes with a tiny little bit of a ski tip, or a bigger ski tip on the front, it's actually lost a massive amount of P3. It's gone completely. And when we x-ray that, this is what we see. This is how, what we see. Now, why does it happen? It happens because the tip of P3 was being starved of its blood supply. Starved of blood. Why? Well, because there was pressure. Pressure from the tip of P3 pushing down on the vasculature that's below that, so the circumflex artery and the solar dermis. And it's pushing down constantly over and over and over and over in a constant pressure. And this gradually means that over time, this part of the bone just, just, it just can't survive because bone, in case you didn't know, needs a good blood supply. It needs nutrients just like every other part of the body does. And if it doesn't continue to get that blood supply and those nutrients, it will, it will just die. It, it, it cannot carry on because it, it needs all of that blood supply. So gradually over time, it starts to lose its tip and it completely disappears. Now, when we have a situation like this, it's incredibly grave and there really is no saving the animal. And once you had an X-ray and you see this on an X-ray, if you keep this animal alive, it's going to continually dip in and out of abscessing and pain and it's, it's gonna have a very poor quality of life. And so unfortunately, they lose their lives because they are in such a lot of pain. We see more and more and more of this as we do our 
cadavers and actually as we deal with more people who come to us with horses that have laminitis. If we go to a situation with a chronic laminitic that has been in and out of acute laminitis for a long period of time, the very first thing that we do is ask for an x-ray because we need to see what's going on inside the foot because if we have a significant amount of bone loss and even really just a small amount of bone loss the chances of that horse regaining quality of life when it gets to this point zero pretty much so it's not it's not a good thing at all and it's not something we should be seeing in horses feet and i've heard all kinds of explanations for the reason that horses get this bone loss i've heard that it's just severe laminitis it, or severe founder as it's called and that through i'll use my red pen and that through inflammation this is what's happened it started to lose bone well that's not the truth it isn't that that happens what happens is all about down here it's all about starving that bone of a decent blood supply and that is how osteonecrosis works and that osteonecrosis can work in humans too it can work in any to any bone that is crushing the blood supply and therefore starving itself of blood we can't replace a pedal bone we can't do that it, it's not something that is <laughs> we're able to do we can't do it so when we get osteonecrosis this is what happens now i just want to we're going to talk about why they get osteonecrosis in a second but i just wanted to define the difference between osteonecrosis osteopenia and osteoporosis because these are all sort of talked about but this one here the necrosis is different to the penia and the porosis. So these two here, osteoporosis and osteopenia, are all about bone density. So the bone keeps its shape, but what happens is that the bone becomes porous. That's why we have porosis, it's porous. Before we get porosis, we get osteopenia, and that is where we're starting to lose that bone density. And if that continues, we get into full osteoporosis. Now, osteoporosis can uh, be associated with age, with in human beings, with people that have got older and they aren't moving around so much, and so they're losing bone density. They're also not getting the right nutrients. And of course, we all know to, to, to make great bones, we need one a major, major mineral, which is calcium. So when we get osteopenia and osteoporosis and we get this la lack of bone density, then we're in the risk zone of breaking bones. So when you have lack of bone density, you can break a bone. And, it's, and that's why older people are at risk. And this can be exacerbated by all sorts of things that they found out, such as smoking, the wrong diet, alcohol, all kinds of things can lead to osteopenia and then osteoporosis. But that's not what this is. This is osteonecrosis, where it literally has died. The bone has died through pressure. So why does it happen? Why does osteonecrosis happen? Let's have a look. So we've talked about this before, haven't we? So we've got a horse that's now getting, a, or a pony, that's having a laminitic attack. Now, this pony happens to have, oop, this pony happens to have its foot in the right position. Here we go. But unfortunately, it's being fed incorrectly. It's having too much grass, too much sugar. The signs have been there. We've had lots of rings. These rings have been coming along and getting really intense and very frequent. There may be fat pads, there may be other symptoms, and that's something I can talk to you about in another lesson. And the horse gets an acute attack of laminitis. So this horse gets an acute attack of laminitis. Now, that originally P3 had been in the right position, but now we have got stretch beginning so it gets wider towards the bottom it's narrower at the top and wider towards the bottom now in a horse that is trimmed correctly down to the hard sole plane 
then P3 stays in the right position. The horse has P3 in exactly the right position with its bony column. Now, the industry will tell you that what will happen is, is over time, and it might happen quite quickly, that P3 will rotate in the capsule like this. And as if we had point of frog here when it was there originally, and it's rotated that way almost going behind the point of the frog. Now we know that doesn't happen because the point of the frog stays steady. Plus we also know that if you have a horse that is trimmed to mother nature's constants, rotation doesn't happen. P3 stays in, the mo in, in its right position, but you still have stretch. And then eventually over time, when you change the diet and the ma management, you start to get this really distinct healing angle coming in and the foot starts to look really funky and really ugly. We've talked about that before. We know about that. If you're confused and you don't understand what I'm talking about, do go back to the HM page and look back at some of the other videos because you'll see what we're talking about here. When the foot begins to distort and it distorts away from this HPA, which is the hoof pastern access. You have the, the whole point of when the foot starts to heal is it will find its natural hoof pastern access. If you keep this at its constant, if you, if you trim to mother nature's constants or mother nature's blueprint, which is the hard sole plane. And it, it never fails because that is determined by the horse. And we don't employ P, P, T, which is personal preference trimming. We don't do that. We are guided entirely by the horse and by their own hard sole plane. And they've all got one. Mother Nature created one for every single horse. And if you keep to the hard sole plane, you cannot ever go wrong. You can't, you can't, you can't distort the foot at all because you're just keeping to the hard sole plane. But that doesn't stop the horse being subject to getting laminitis. That's different. Laminitis is all about the diet, all about the diet and the management. And if that's not right, and that's, that's who, who is in control of the diet and the management? Who is in control of the diet and the management? The owner. This bit here, this own, and that's the bit you have to step up to when your horse has laminitis. And it's hard because you're not quite sure what you're going to do. So one of the things you do is you contact professionals or you contact your farrier or your vet and you say, look, what, I, I don't know what, what to do. So the vet or the farrier come along all together and they say, right, one of the things we might do is we might put it in a shoe, uh, a heart bar shoe, or we might put it in a clog any one of those things. But while they're doing that, one of the things that happens is the heels begin to go up or they're not trimmed. And so consequently, this distortion starts to get kind of hidden because as the heels go up like this and they start to remove quite a bit of this toe here, they're starting to try and get this in line with the hoof past and access. But the only way that you can do that is by raising the heels or allowing those heels to grow. So now the heels are getting higher and higher. And the result of that is that P3, let's just move that to there, P3 begins to look like it has rotated. Through this continual chopping off the toe, chopping off the toe, chopping off the toe, we've now completely lost this part of the foot which is our guide in order for us to keep everything balanced. And therefore, every time you take this off, you then start to cause pressure. Let's just take all this back here. You then start to cause pressure here. By your continually removing, 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 and there's none of this toe wall on the, floor, on the, on the ground. And, and now we know that that affects feedback, but also now we're being thinned here and we're having this pressure go up to P3. And the horse is kept in this shape, in this situation, sometimes for years, absolute years. They're sore, they seem to dive in and out of laminitis. And then when they're x-rayed, you come along, sometimes if it's been a first attack, you'll catch it like this, 
But if it's been this continual attack and the feet have got this more and more distorted and the, the, the heels have gone up and the toes got shorter and it just becomes this distorted mass while P3 on, is, is on the inside being out of alignment with its bony column, over time this pressure here causes this bone to be lost and lost and lost through that continual, continual pressure. And that is osteonecrosis. And that didn't need to happen. Because if the heels had been left where they should have been, down to Mother Nature's constant, down to the hard sole plane, the P3 would not have rotated in its capsule. So had they been left down here, P3 would still have been in a better position, but it would have had stretch. And what we do is we allow that stretch to grow out and it looks ugly it doesn't look very nice at all but we've got to get over that we've got to get over this ugly we've got to get over this this worry that this toe is tearing the lamina it doesn't happen on the mechanical level and we've proved it time and time again because you keep a horse like this with its wide base large surface area it's got a big lamella wedge here it doesn't trip, it gets sounder and sounder and sounder. This is protected because we're not losing depth under P3 and gradually, gradually it grows in. And then eventually, oops, eventually you have the, oops, that's gone a bit far up there. Eventually you have the foot that that horse needed once all of this laminitis has all finally grown out. But you've kept the horse safe because P3 has remained in its correct position. Once you start trying to chase pathology, we call it chasing pathology, and you try to make that hoof capsule look normal from the outside, that is when problems begin to occur for the horse. So if you have a horse who has sadly lost part of its pedal bone, um, oops, here we go. And it's lot, oh gosh, it's gone all funny. It's lost part of its pedal bone. Then there's no going back. You can't save it. And it was unnecessary. It didn't need to happen. That happened because of misinformation, ignorance and false beliefs. By thinking that you can shoo or trim laminitis away. You can't, you can't do it. The only thing that will stop laminitis is by sorting out the diet and the management. And that bit there is the bit that you don't get help with. Nobody ever comes to talk to you. Your vet or your farrier doesn't come and say, okay, let's go and have a look at how you keep your horse. Let's see if we can make this better. What they do is they jump straight down the box rest route first, rather than talking to you, oop, rather than talking to you, about how you were keeping your horse, how were you feeding your horse, were you giving it bag feed, supplements, hypernutrition, how much grass were you giving, a lot, you, don't, you never know, you don't know how much grass, are you giving your horse enough hay, were all the warning signs there, yes they were, we've never been to an acute attack of laminitis where all the warning signs just, just weren't there and the horse suddenly came down with it, we've been seeing these warning signs for a long long time, you don't get helped with that, but we do. We help you with the diet and the management. We help you understand. And that's the hardest bit because for an owner to actually own that bit, that's sort of like two thirds of the problem that this horse is suffering from. Laminitis is the owner's issue. That's the owner. And this here, this loss of bone, that's the hoof care professionals problem. Well, it's actually the horse's problem, isn't it? Because the horse is now going to have to be put to sleep because he's going to live a life of suffering if he doesn't. And that is seriously bad and it didn't ever need to happen. There you go. It's not rocket science lesson on osteonecrosis. I hope that helped. I hope you understood it. And it's this bit here that we've been talking about, osteonecrosis, which is bone loss through starvation of blood supply.
doesn't need to happen, guys. It's a travesty, really. It shouldn't be happening. We should have horses who, if they're going into laminitis, have their foot trimmed properly. And the owner needs to learn about diet and management. I hope that helped. See you again in another lesson. Bye-bye.